Phoenix Advocates is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to reduce first responder fatalities through education, action, and awareness. It was started by four grieving widows who met as a result of their shared trauma. Join us in the next 30 minutes as they share their stories and tell us what Phoenix Advocates is doing to reach out to our community. I'm Christy Breslin, and this is Harford Magazine. Celeste Flynn is one of the original founders of Phoenix Advocates. She's here to tell us why she started this very important organization, what it means to her, and what they're doing for community outreach to help others that are in the same position as them. Hi, Celeste. Hi. Celeste, what is Phoenix Advocates? Phoenix Advocates is a, about a six, nine month long, not nine month long venture now that we've um, been working on. Myself, Sarah, Claire were the original members of that. We've added Jen to the board now most recently. Um, it was a way for us to kind of channel the work that we were doing individually and, and concentrate it into what we, th we saw the greater need to be within the fire service community and their families. Um, so it was a way for us to formalize that and actually reach more people and do it in, in a way that was um, more structured and um, I guess more organized. So we made this choice about a year ago to take it the next steps with it and say, we're each doing these things individually. Let's put our minds together, put our efforts together and really make this thing happen and put this, this legacy out there for these guys. And tell me more about how the founding members first came together to start this organization. So Nate's fire was in 2018. He died July 23rd, 2018. Um, at that point, I didn't have a person like me. I was kind of on my own. Uh, we lived in Harford County. Nate was killed in Howard County where he worked. Um, I was geographically separated from the county there. And then just the fact that he was the first line of duty death for the county too made it challenging. So there weren't a lot of resources for me. So three years later, as I'm home listening to the fire radio and listening to people on social media talk about the fire that's happening in Frederick County, phone calls start coming in from folks and it's very similar to Nate's fire. And they're, they're asking, are you listening to this? Are you, are you hearing this? It sounds just like Nate's fire. I'm like, yeah, it really does. Uh, again, lightning strike to the home there, CSST fire, um, Josh fell to the basement, Nate fell to the basement. So I'm, I'm hearing all of this go through and I realize that there's another family out there that's now like me. Um, I reach out to, the, to their department saying, I'm here as a resource. I know what it's like to be there day one without anybody to reach out to, to talk to, to share your, your feelings with, or even ask questions of. And Sarah and I became connected about, I guess about a week after the event um, you know, that the funeral happened. She is very cautious. She, she had to vet me <laughs> first before she agreed to speak with me. Um, you know, because people just, it can be a challenging time all around. So Sarah and I connected and um, we started working through what we knew about the fires. Um, from there, we went into some training topics, worked through some legislation things, and that's how we kind of got started with our joint efforts towards the overall mission. You mentioned CSST. What is that? What does that stand for? CSST is corrugated stainless steel tubing. So it is um, piping that carries the gas from your manifold into your home, through your home, kind of like, um, like the, the, the circuit that takes it from the manifold, from your tank, from your supply line, from your, your supplier, to your appliances. Okay, and that, how did that uh, play into the accident involving Nate? Sure, um, so in both Nate's and Josh's, Josh's fires, there was lightning strikes um, to the properties, and um, the lightning, the CSST fails through energetic, um, it will search for ground. So it basically the CSST fails where it crosses another piece of metal. And in that point, it arcs, it sparks, and in some cases creates a fire. In both of these cases, how the CSST is installed along the beams of the home, these fires start, and it's a little tiny blowtorch of a fire that's burning. Um, these burn for, you know, in each of these cases, an hour before the fire department got there. So the main beam of the home was consumed, essentially, before they 
even knew what was happening. Um, the fire is concealed almost because it's in the floor. It doesn't present as a basement fire or a fire on the first floor. So the firefighters go into the homes looking for the fire essentially, and they don't know what they're walking into. So in these two cases, they both entered the homes looking for fires and fell through the floors into the basement levels because um, that was where the, the compromise was. The beam was compromised, the floor was compromised. Their body weight was the final piece to, to make that hole and, and push them to the basements where they became trapped. Is this preventable? And does Phoenix Advocates provide training? So there was a lot of investigative work done after Nate's fire um, through the Howard County Fire Investigative Office and then the ATF. Um, there was a lot of modeling done after that as well. So a lot of lessons and things were gained from that. Um, that whole effort was put into a 30 minute training program that the ATF put together. And we have now taken that out on the road. Because what we're finding is a lot of places don't understand the risk of the lightning fires, lightning induced fires and the CSST failures. And in some cases it could be a fire, in some cases it could be a gas leak. There's, there's different ways these things can impact homes and impact our firefighters. So we've taken that out there, we've taken it to the investigative community, to the firefighting community, and making them aware of the dangers that they could be experiencing when these things happen. Now Celeste, you've already helped a lot of families of fallen firefighters. How many families have you helped? Oh, it's, it's really hard to say. Um, the, the family perspective of it is um, a bit different than the fire community because we, we give them messages and things that they, we hope that it's a thoughtful conversation topic for them to take home. Um, unfortunately, in our cases, we have been on the other side of a lot of it. So there are um, benefits and paperwork and all the things that go into it that we ourselves were prepared people. You know, Nate and I were prepared. Um, we thought we had everything taken care of and then he dies. Um, and from that, you realize, I'm not on this bank account. I don't know where this password is. You know, I don't have this piece of paper that I need to make this, this, this benefit uh, submission. So it becomes this whole process of, even though we thought we had everything checked off, we really weren't. Um, there really is no way to know all the things you don't know until you're going through it. So we've kind of taken that message too, to the fire departments, but we're hoping that they take it home, right? And then they're telling their spouses, like, hey, this is a conversation, it's gonna be a hard one to have, but, we need to talk about these things because if anything should happen to me, I want to make sure that you're taken care of. And that's been a big push for us as well because we don't want to have to, um, we don't want to answer the questions on the other side. We will, but we don't want to be the people to have to tell them, you know, okay, well, this is going to be a lot harder because you didn't take care of this in the front. Phoenix Advocates is such a great resource for so many people that are going through what you went through and really don't know who to turn to. And now they have you. So how do they get in touch? So we have a website, um, it's phoenixadvocates.org. And we also have social media that we can um, take messages and things through. Um, we have um, an opportunity for departments to reach out to us if they want us to bring any of the training programs that we have to them, uh, we will certainly do that. Um, we've, we've done you know, a lot of um, things here locally and international, or not internationally, locally and nationally for those. So um, you know, we're happy to spread the message and make sure that the training information gets pushed out there um, you know, for the CSST piece, as well as the family plan planning piece. Celeste, thank you so much. I mean, these services are just so valuable to so many people. And again, thank you for doing this because it's not an easy thing to do and we need brave, strong women like you to lead the way. So thank you for that. Yeah, I think we always say that people call us brave. We just say we're exhausted is more the, uh, <laughs> the descriptor that we would use for ourselves. Well, you are community servants. We thank you so much and we thank your husbands. And coming up next, we're going to speak to another member of Phoenix Advocates who will share her story. Stay with us. Sarah Laird is one of the original members of Phoenix Advocates, like Celeste has just told us about. And when these two met, they formed an organization that is just essential to so many people that need the support after having a traumatic experience like they do. These brave women are here to share their story, and Sarah is here to tell us about Josh. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Christy. Now, Sarah, you connected with Celeste. You helped bring Phoenix Advocates to life. Tell us about why you got involved. I want to know Joshua's story. So my husband was Battalion Chief Josh Laird. He was a 21-year career veteran of Frederick County, Maryland um, Fire Department. He died on August 11th, 2021 in a house fire um, that was caused by 
failure of the corrugated stainless steel tubing um, after a lightning strike. Walk me through the days after Sarah. What was that like? How did you cope with that? Um, I was totally in shock. I think now, um, you know, when I look back on that, I definitely, I don't remember everything. There are definitely days and times and conversations that I don't remember. A lot of it, good or bad, um, was documented in the media. So I do have a lot of um, pictures and videos um, to, to look back on to help me re remember. And Phoenix Advocates, one of the reasons that you started this was to help other people that are going through the same situation that you are, right? Yeah, definitely. I was fortunate enough to have Celeste and then very shortly after met Jen and then met Clara. And I think we have all, you know, collectively being together, um, we have more strength. And so we recognize um, the need for that. And progressively, I would say even just in the last couple months, we're finding that there's so much need um, to help people that are in our positions, specifically um, firefighters and police officers who die um, because of a medical um, related illness or cancer, those families often don't get the support that um, Celeste and Clara and Jen and I got um, having our husbands die in a traumatic event. Sarah, I know one of your main goals has been working with legislation to make sure that these firefighters and their families are taken care of and also to find ways to prevent these incidents from happening. Yeah, so we've got um, a couple of different things we're doing. Um, we are a 501c3, so we don't spend any of our money um, on on any of the political activity that we do, but we do help get the word out. We do help um, organize other widows and we work on a couple of different areas of legislation so far. One um, is cancer. There's a cancer bill federally to recognize firefighter and police officers' cancers as a line of duty. Um, right now, the federal government does not recognize those, even though the state of Maryland does. Um, so we've been working with other widows, cancer widows, um, to help move that legislation forward. And then within Maryland, uh, Celeste and I have been working for the past three years um, I was in Annapolis six months after my husband died working on our first piece of legislation there to start to improve the requirements for corrugated stainless steel tubing or CSST within the state of Maryland. Celeste mentioned it, but can you go more in depth with me about CSST and what it means? Yep, so CSST, I have a, a sample of it here. Um, this yellow piece is the first generation. This has been used um, since early 2000s, even, even prior um, in some areas. And the product was originally developed in uh, Japan because it's flexible and it's lightweight, so it withstood earthquakes. But here we don't so much have the earthquake problem, but because it is so flexible and lightweight, when there's a lightning strike, if the energy from the lightning strike reaches the CSST, it can cause a perforation, which then creates a gas leak. And in both Josh and Nate's cases, that ignited the fire the gas escaping lit immediately, and it actually burnt the house from the inside out. But it can also have other, um, other ways that it can start the fire. The gas, um, sometimes it just creates a leak and the fire doesn't start immediately, so it can create a gas leak in a home that can lead to an explosion. Um, in places like New Jersey where they've had um, flooding, like due to Hurricane Sandy, we see that sometimes when the houses have been flooded, the salt water sits on the piping, and even though the house has been renovated and everything else looks great, that's still corroding. So after time, it can corrode the, the pipe and create a gas leak as well that leads to an explosion. Now, Sarah, with Phoenix Advocates, what is the mission? What are you hoping to accomplish in the future? Um, I mean, we have multiple missions. Um, you know, the one is getting the word out about the CSST, not only within the fire service and delivering training to the fire service to help them identify these fires, but also getting the word out to the general public, making them aware that if there's a lightning strike near your home, if you know if this material's in your house or not, you know then to go look for a fire or to shut off the gas, to be aware. If there is a fire, you can notify the fire department when you call 911 and let them know that you have CSST in your house. Um, and then also raising awareness um, with the fire service in general about planning for um, unfortunate case of a line of duty death. Um, all of us were not as prepared as we thought. We were all professionals, had careers, thought we had everything um, together, and we found out on the other side that we really didn't. Thank you so much for what you're doing for the community, and this information is so valuable to so many people, and it's great to have someone like Phoenix Advocates that we can turn to in a situation like this. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, coming up next, we're going to speak to another member of Phoenix Advocates to share her story and what she hopes to accomplish with their mission moving forward. Clara Fenlong joins me now to talk about her husband, Kenny, and his experience on Engine 14. He was a firefighter in Baltimore City. She's here to tell us more about his legacy and how Phoenix Advocates not only helped her, but can help you as well. Hi, Clara. Hi. Clara, I know that Phoenix Advocates is very near and dear to your heart, and you went through something that all these women have gone through with the loss of your dear husband. So can you tell me about Kenny? Um, Kenny definitely had a firefighter's heart. Um, he was a firefighter, firefighter, you know, um, the type of person that would come home and still live the lifestyle, firefighters, um, brotherhood. Every time we needed work in the house, for example, he would also look for firefighters that had second jobs and things of that nature. So he all, he was always trying to, you know, uplift his community. Um, everyone that has ever met him, that's the largest feedback that I ever gotten is that he always had a smile on his face. And even though the work was hard being a paramedic in Baltimore City, um, he always had a smile. He was always happy to be there. Um, you wouldn't see him complaining much about what he did. So yes, he loved to be a firefighter. He was very excited to move to a station that would be busier with more fires he waited for three years for the transfer, even though other companies wanted him. And he just said, I'm, I'm going to stick around and wait it, you know, for Engine 14, where ultimately, you know, six months later, he died. Um, but yes. Well, he was a firefighter for how many years? So he started his career in Wheaton, um, in Silver Spring area, and he was a lifetime member with that volunteer company, and he started in 11, so 2011, that's when he started, and he got his paramedic license and all of that, and then he went to Baltimore City in 2014, and ultimately died in 2022. What was it like being married to such a dedicated public servant? I guess people don't really understand that he's on call pretty much 24-7, and that's not only difficult on you, but on your family as well. It never ended. Um, you know, like the job came home with you as well. You'd have always calls, like for Kenny's case, because he was also um, fluent in Spanish, you would get a lot of calls from his own members asking for help because sometimes they wouldn't speak the language and, you know, there would be a discussion and people wouldn't understand what the firefighters were saying. So it would be pretty common that we would get phone calls like at 10 p.m. when he's off and, you know, he would just have to translate and say, okay, he's saying you have to go to the hospital type of thing. Um, so. He lived that lifestyle, so when Joshua died um, in a few months before he did, right in August, he listened to that radio over and over and over again, and he would hide it from me because he knew I would not be happy, you know, with the possibility. He would put the bug in my mind, right, that that's a possibility, so he was just going into weird rooms and listening over and over again, trying to understand what happened until, you know, he couldn't hide it anymore, and then we had that conversation. And we were actually on vacation when it happened, so, you know, we had a conversation and things of that nature, but he was always everything firefighter. Like, he loved where he was. Like, anyone that knows Kenny knows that he was the happiest where he ultimately died. You know, he was so proud of Engine 14. The first few weeks that he got there, he was already changing all his gears and buying new hats that say, you know, Engine 14, buying um, T-shirts and stuff like that. So he waited for that transfer for a long time and he was very happy. I mean, that gives me a little bit of solace that he was where he wanted to be. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And Clara, what happened on Engine 14? Um, I do believe that accident was caused you know, by a failure of the vacant system that Baltimore City has. Um, and I believe that's what happened, that they just didn't have that clear indication anymore that there was a building that you know, had been on fires before, had hurt firefighters before. And yes, you know, the possibility of someone there, I believe 
I don't know where the information came from. You know, the person calling is always someone in distress. So I don't know if they ever saw someone in there, but we know now that there was never anybody there. So the call also came in inaccurate for the most part. So I believe that's in a combination of all of those things was what caused the accident. Um, but yeah. I can't even begin to imagine how difficult this process was. How has Phoenix Advocates helped you and your family heal? Honestly, after time for grieving, time when you're sad, time when you're crying, I always say it's time to work, right? Like the worst case scenario for me would be to see this happening over and over again and seeing new families, what I always say their day one, right? My day one was horrible, so I can't imagine every time that happens to another family. So to me, that's the main thing. Um, but I feel one way that it could help, and it has helped me, is just being around people that treasury also touch in a way or another, because when it happens to you, you do think, why me? You know, there is so many firefighters. It could have been anyone, but it had to be my firefighter. Um, but when you are around other people and that the foundation also allows me to see a lot of widows, right? Like, um, so I'm like, yes, it happens everywhere. So you start not feeling so unlucky. And you're like, okay, this happens to a lot more people than we think. Um, yeah, so all different situations, married, not married, with kids, without kids. So it happens all across the country and that's why also those events we all get together and you feel like okay I'm part of a community it's not necessarily an isolated event that could only happen to me you know uh, I'm not the unluckiest person in the planet it can happen to anyone who is married to a firefighter or plans to have a life with a firefighter so yeah that has helped me a lot just being around people that have the same experiences as I've had Yes. Claire, thank you so much because that is not an easy story to tell and you are a very strong woman and we thank Kenny immensely for what he did and his legacy will live on. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Chrissy, for your time. I'm Absolutely. happy to share. Well, coming up next, we're going to speak to another member of Phoenix Advocates that is going to tell us about her husband and his legacy and how Phoenix Advocates helped her and her family get through the grieving process. Jen Alcorn is one of the founding members of Phoenix Advocates. She's here to tell us her story and why this organization is so important and what they're doing to make sure this mission is brought forth right here in Harford County. Hi, Jen. Hi, Christy. Jen, first, I would really like to thank you for being here and for sharing your story. And if you wouldn't mind, tell us about Stu. So uh, Stu was um, a lieutenant with Frederick City Police uh, for 14 years, and um, we met in high school and were married uh, 17 years when he passed away. Um, so long friendship, um, long marriage. We have three beautiful children, um, loved his job, was definitely doing what he was meant to do. And I know this is difficult, but what exactly happened to Stu? So Stu uh, suffered a medical emergency at home uh, early on a Sunday morning after doing a triathlon the day before. Um, ultimately, it was found that he suffered a pulmonary embolus but had severe cardiovascular disease that we didn't know about at all. So at 39, he had um, scarring on his heart, enlarged heart, and 70 to 80% blockages in all of his major arteries. So that meant that he had zero chance of surviving that, that embolism. Um, so that started us on a journey towards a occupational disease and what that meant and things I'm now very familiar with that I had no idea um, what that entailed at the time. And the increased risk that first responders have for cardiovascular disease, um, the shifts, the stress, all of those things. Um, and so you will often hear about, um, you know, a cardiac event if they're working, um, but heart disease doesn't decide that it's gonna take you when you're 
sitting at your desk or in your car. Um, so that's the journey that we've been on since August of 21. And how are you and the kids handling this great loss? Um, it's a void. Um, it's, um, it's, it's hard. But from Stu's passing, you have joined Phoenix Advocates. Mm -hmm. And what are you hoping to accomplish um, for our community? I know that you want to bring more awareness. So my friendship with Sarah Laird, um, who worked together with Celeste and Clara to found Phoenix Advocates, has kind of been my widow sister side by side um, since our husbands were in the same county um, and just 11 days apart from each other. Um, Stu actually stood and attended Josh's service. So, and then died three days later. So, um, been along with all of those things and all of that this entails with our kids together. Um, so Phoenix and the mission is truly education and support for survivors, navigating benefits and just the gauntlet that you can't imagine you're facing after the most horrific reality, really. Phoenix Advocates offers so many great resources. It has been beneficial not only for you, but it's also beneficial for our community. Tell us about that. So um, Phoenix and what we're doing as far as bringing law enforcement and fire together in our efforts for what we're doing around education, um, line of duty death planning for first responders, but also educating family members so that if the worst happens, there's a plan and no matter what you're going to be reeling, but um, having a plan is certainly being prepared is better than, than not being prepared. So the ability to do outreach, educate the first responder community, as well as the entities that employ um, these first responders so that they can make sure that their benefits and their offerings are where they need to be as well. Um, and um, support for survivors. So there's, you know, countless spouses like myself who, if I hadn't had a Sarah Laird, I, I don't know where I would be. I don't know that I would have found what I needed to or known what to ask or where to go. So our goal is to, to make that a piece of how we're helping survivors. Well, you mentioned outreach. You are definitely accomplishing that. So let's talk about some of the fundraising and community events. Awesome. So we have um, Grassroots done some uh, fundraising through merchandise, but we've had several events. We've had a lot of community partners that have done um, fundraisers through different restaurants or, like I said, events. Um, we have a couple of things coming up. Um, a big one in Frederick in um, October. So that'll be um, a celebration that Sarah and I have been doing um, in Josh and Stu's memory, but broader it's a day of the dead um, because Josh was such a fan. Um, so she, you know, brought our family into that. But now it's turned into a one day Saturday at a brewery to a two day event. Um, and the proceeds from that will go to support Phoenix Advocates as well. Jen, the money raised, the proceeds, what exactly does that go towards? So money is being used for resources to put together the presentations, to travel to conferences and to where the first responders are so that we can deliver um, these educational pieces. Jen, thank you so much for all that you've done for the community, for sharing your story. That is not easy to do. And of course, for being out there and helping all these families that could use these vital services right here in Harford County. Thank you. As you've heard these stories today about the heartbreak and trauma that these women and their families have gone through, I hope it inspires you to learn more, volunteer, donate, get involved with this wonderful organization. If you would like more information on them, visit their website at phoenixadvocates.org. I'm Christy Breslin. See you next month on Harvard Magazine.